It was only last weekend that Michael Johnson helped the Newcastle Falcons continue their brilliant pre-season form with wins over the Brisbane Bullets and the Illawarra Hawks. Then trouble as the pure shooter complained of stomach pains late yesterday afternoon and after consultation with Falcons doctor Andrew McDonald, he was referred to a specialist. Michael then was immediately rushed to hospital where his dangerously inflamed appendix were removed at 9 o'clock last night. Still groggy from the operation late today and because of the severity of the case, it will be next Tuesday before he's released from hospital and it will be three weeks before he hits the boards, just in time for the start of the National Basketball League season. In the Hunter, the Forestry Commission says areas like Goulburn River and Barrington Tops National Parks will remain just that, parks. Well, there's no new areas being opened up because of resource security. It's still the same ball game as it was before. According to John Reynolds from the Commission, resource security only applies to multi-million dollar timber mills, outfits much bigger than those in the local industry. In the years ahead, however, resource security could mean increased timber milling in the area. John Reynolds admits giant pulp mills would be getting a green light from Canberra to broaden their horizons. So there was a possibility of a mill at Newcastle, as provided you can uh, be sure that there's no environmental uh, degrade. Dumsey reaffirmed his number one status by winning the $440,000 Winfield ASC Series at Parramatta Speedway two weeks back. The champ will be in for a torrid time as he comes up against a number of informed drivers headed by Skip Jackson who broke the eight lap record in the Stars Trophy dash four weeks ago at the Motodrome. Other drivers who will worry Dumsey are Brooke Tatnell, Bob Tunks, Wayne Skipper, Brian Britton and Gary Brazier. The Hunter Valley will be represented by Alan Bates. John Headley and Greg Webster of the Heaton Birmingham Gardens Club won their way through to the final with a 23-19 win over Press Hornby and Jack Beatty, while weight and fakes were too good for Ian Barrett and Terry Webster. The Headley pairing shot out to an early 11-4 lead and the more favoured pair looked in trouble. But the brilliance of Noel Waite slowly but surely narrowed the gap and on the 15th end they took the lead in the final for the first time. Headley wasn't going to give up without a fight and went to the lead on the 17th end 16-15. Wait tied it up on the 18th and retook the lead on the 19th. But the crunch came on the penultimate end with Fakes and Wait able to grab a massive five shots and effectively close out the match. Headley grabbed two shots on the final end but it was a well-deserved win to Noel Wait and Ron Fakes 22-18. John Schuster kicked a goal to make it 6-2 and then the floodgates opened up. Russell Wire was the next to score for the Magpies and they led by 10. The Knights were trying hard and again it was Schuster who made the breaks but they couldn't be converted to points. Slam and Sam Stewart tried to fire up his charges by leading from the front but continual frustrations for the Blue and Reds. Stephen Burns then added another try for Western Suburbs and it was looking as the big spenders were starting to really hit their straps. Sean Devine widened the gap and it was quickly becoming an embarrassment for Newcastle as the Magpies had raced to a 20-point lead and looked like making it more. And they did, through veteran Trevor Cogger, who crossed for try number six. But the Maggies weren't finished. Powerful kangaroo prop Bob Linder, one of the form players of the afternoon, completed the route with another try and the Western Suburbs Magpies had steamrolled their way to a 40 points to two victory and will go into next weekend's match against the Gold Coast with a lot of confidence. And at Brambles Field today, the Newcastle representative team in the green and gold played last year's Metropolitan Cup winners right eastward in a trial and the Newcastle side was riddled with former Winfield Cup players such as Neil Baker, Troy Clark, Brian Quinton, Richard Jones and Trevor Crowe. 
It was Clark who scored the first try as the ball went from Jones to Higgins, who put Clark in a gap and his pace was too much for the struggling defence. But the boys from Sydney hit back as Henry Wemaz stood in a tackle close to the line and he was able to offload to hooker Kane Reeves and he crashed over to score. A short time later, Newcastle again crossed for a try as Donaldson made a half break on to Brian Quinton and looming up was Clark and with plenty of strength was able to ground the ball and Newcastle were on a roll. Launched in 1969, the Doris Smith Scholarship has been presented only six times. Its latest recipient is 24-year-old Warners Bay operatic singer Liana Lagofsky. The girl who began her career in a primary school choir was presented with a cheque for $9,000 at the Newcastle Conservatorium today. That will help Liana through the highlight of her award, an extensive campaign of overseas tuition. Today, the judge began to sum up the two-week trial, outlining the evidence of some of the Naglukas' 49 passengers. The jury had heard there were no regulations governing the number of passengers at the time of the tragedy in January last year. Mr Warner and nine passengers were on the flybridge at the time of the capsize. Already, a professor of engineering has stated that even one person there would affect the boat's ability to right itself, even though there was seating for seven or eight moulded into the boat's structure. The passengers called as witnesses said they had felt quite secure. Mr Warner's defence lawyer said the skipper was experienced and safety conscious and trusted his boat. He claimed the size of the flybridge and wheelhouse gave a distorted perception of the passenger capacity of the vessel. He also said there was no proper evidence to prove it was Mr Warner's fault that the boat veered over to one side and the skipper did try to correct the problem but to no avail. Judge Payne will continue his summing up tomorrow of evidence from expert witnesses, including a naval architect, and it's expected the jury will retire to consider its verdict. Dr Barry Thomas delivers around 50 babies each year. A delivery can take 12 hours performed at any time of the day or night. For that service, the basic rate is $113. Doctors have been fighting for increased fees for years, both in obstetrics and anaesthetic work. In these specialities, medical defence insurance can cost GPs as much as $5,000. And Dr Thomas says rural doctors simply can't afford it. It's a dollars and cents thing that's costing us. I must stress this, that we are putting, we're out of pocket. I can give you examples of that. All right, well, but there's no threat to lives? Not, th not if we can help it, no, certainly not. Representations to the health department fell flat when the doctors were offered 39% fee rises. They refused and have handed in notice to remove their specialised services. If there's no change of mind from the department within 28 days, doctors say obstetrics and anaesthetics will be wound down here at Singleton Hospital and patients will have to travel 60 kilometres to Maitland. The news is a major blow for Singleton's yearly batch of 250 expectant couples. It's a pretty important service. There's a lot of, a lot of women around here having babies, especially at the <laughs> moment. And uh, I think it would be hard for a lot of people. While the doctor's waiting rooms will keep filling up, patients can draw some comfort in the fact that emergency cases will still be treated at Singleton.
thousands of hectares in the Meriwar Castellus area are being prepared for next season's crops. But while the process is the same as years before, this year's products will be a different mix. Price of wheat has dropped uh, far too low. Uh, it's in some cases, and unless you keep your yields up, it's dropping below the cost of production. In the early 80s, the Meriwal wheat silos took in around 60,000 tonnes of wheat each year. Last year, just 9,000. In 1991, it could be as low as 4,000. Farmer Will Sutton says growers have to diversify. This year, he's planting cronola and linseed, cutting back his wheat by more than a half. A flood of subsidised American wheat on the world market has dropped prices from $140 to $90 per tonne. And local farmers are struggling. A call by the Grains Council for a government guaranteed price for wheat, a system similar to the Wool 4 scheme, was rejected by Primary Industries Minister Kerrin. Instead, the government offered the Wheat Board a $100 million extension on borrowings. But Will Sutton says this is just band-aid treatment. Supporting calls from agricultural lobby groups, he wants costs tightened outside the farm gate. By becoming more efficient on our waterfronts, our transport systems, our handling uh, areas, and uh, just become more efficient in everything we do. That's the only way we can compete with uh, our overseas competitors. It's estimated the drop in wheat production will cost the nation $750 million. But the Grains Council says the greatest loss could be markets which were earned over decades. Peter Ryan, NBN News. The Lady Slalom event should be a classic with Tony Kirby Neville, the tournament's number one seed, and if she reproduces this form shown at Moomba in Melbourne last weekend, she will be pretty tough to beat. But her main rival should once again be Karen Neville, who was a past winner of Ozki and the overall champion at Moomba this year. Karen took an early advantage today, training hard on the tricky waters of the Williams River. In the men's event, it's hard to go past champion Bruce Neville, who pulled this out on his first jump at Moomba. Pleased with my form in the States, I won five events over there and uh, you know I won last weekend so I'm looking for a third here, I've won two the last two years so I'm looking for another one. Outside of the very strong Australian contingent here for Oski 91 there is a big representation from overseas with skiers from Canada, America, Sweden, Russia and the United Kingdom. Brother and sister Helena and Mike Shalanda from Sweden are right up there with the very best and for the glamorous number two seed water skiing has been part of her life. Mike will renew his slalom battle with the great Andy Mapple of Great Britain, who last week won the Moomba event and is right on his form. It's a little cold for me down there. You know, it's kind of, you know, we had a real good couple of days before and then it got real cold. And, but, you know, with the end result, I was happy. The court was all but deserted today. The relatives of the five children who drowned in the Nagluka tragedy had seen the guilty verdict handed down yesterday. The sentencing was of immediate interest only to expectant reporters and the accused. However, the long-running trial still had a few twists. Mr Warner emerged shortly after 11am on bail pending the tabling of a pre-sentence report at Gosford Court on April the 4th. Counsel for the defence pleaded for extra time preparing the report, which will include numerous character references and a psychologist's assessment of Mr Mr Warner's state of mind following the tragedy. The deferral of sentencing was opposed by the Crown, which could see no purpose in reiterating Mr Warner's good character, which he said had already been established in the trial. Both defence and prosecution have submitted that a jail sentence would be inappropriate. Waving palms, a trickling brook and cool green lawn. Yes, this really is the usually hectic betting ring. But until Sunday evening, the only sure bet is that the call will be for conifers and cactuses instead of winners and losers. Although a couple of long odds ponies did make the card. 
40 exhibitors have created a green thumbs paradise and after just one day there's every indication that this year's garden fair will break all attendance records. Interest in gardening is booming and one reason is the so-called recession. It's now an historic fact that when times are tough people turn to their gardens. And gardening's also reflecting the growth in environmental awareness with techniques and products experiencing change. The garden fair will continue from 9 until 5 tomorrow and Sunday. As expected, the men's freestyle jump provided plenty of highlights with Dion Ellison throwing the crowd from upside down. And then Dean Mundy hit hard after getting it wrong from the takeoff, but he was okay. World champion American Dave Reinhardt was the star attraction and he qualified first for tomorrow's final, although he had some anxious moments, but his talent enabled him to ski away. Former world barefoot champion Brett Wing was a close second and he will be in the firing line for tomorrow's final along with Jack Ellison and his brother Dion. The men's open jump was also full of drama and the near perfect conditions saw the competitors going hard. On this occasion Danny Budd elected to pass up right at the death and made a spectacular attempt at stopping before hitting the bank of the Williams River. Neil Ritchie from Victoria elected to jump from the 5 foot 6 inch ramp and set the pace with a brilliant 52.9 metres. Austrian Franz Oberleitner grabbed a big one to put the pressure on the rest with a leap of 51.3 metres on his third and final jump. Youngster Grant Barnett then applied the style and elegance and he landed a beauty of 52.2 metres. But the man they all must watch is the winner of last week's Moomba event and defending Oski champion Bruce Neville and he was conservative today but still managed to jump a 55.1 metres. Live telecast of the finals of Oski on NBN from 1 o'clock tomorrow. The parade through Maitland Heritage Mall was supported by youth groups from across the Hunter including eight district police youth clubs. The ranks were swelled by schools, sporting bodies and other organisations marching to the accompaniment of several pipe and brass bands, much to the enjoyment of spectators lining the procession. Youth Week is an annual event but organisers say this is the biggest parade put on in the region to mark the start of the festive week. The event was the result of months of planning but right from the outset the march enjoyed overwhelming support from participants. The the parade is just the beginning. The Heritage Mall will be the scene of festival activities throughout the coming week. Today's choppy conditions made the going a little tougher for Andy Mapple, who had earlier smashed his own Australian record. All he wanted to do was to clench his second Oz ski title, but Mike Shalander made him work for the privilege. He would just get a nice car through, right through the middle of the gates as he picks up one and uh, goes round in two. I lost him from the spray there from this angle, but he's got three. There's three. Now that's all he has to do to win the that's event. The final tally of boys, Andy Mapple 33, Mike Shalander 32.5. In the women's pro jump it looked like Victorian Jody Skipper would take out the title, but Karen Neville had other plans. While she balked at her first jump, her third came close to the 40 metre mark. Might have done it. Very close. Ooh, we're on edge here. 39.8 metres, that's it. She's pulled it out of the bag. In the men's event, Bruce Neville travelling at around 110 kilometres an hour took out the jump with this massive leap of 56.1 metres. Here he is, powering into the jump here, a lot of speed. 
56.1 metres later. Here he is. Pretty good lift off the jump, that one. Bruce would be fairly happy with that jump. There were some radical jumps in the men's freestyle event with Dave Reinhardt equaling his world record, topping off the round with this near-perfect jump. Interesting wrap-up. Boom. Look at that. Oh. oh, he's wrapped, isn't he? Have a look at that. Throwing everything they had at Reinhardt, the Ellison brothers were willing to risk life and limb to steal the title. But then I think he changed his mind. He said, oh, I'll go again. Whoa! Oh, she that would have hurt. It was one and a half. <laughs>Early on the morning of the 12th of May, the court was told, Veach went to his 20-year-old sister Teresa's bedroom where she was sleeping with the intention of having sex. When she awoke, a violent struggle ensued during which the woman was strangled. When asked by police later that day why he had killed her, Veach replied, to stop her from screaming and I thought she would tell on me. Veach then placed her in the boot of her car and drove it three kilometres to Bush off the end of South Seas Drive at Ashtonfield. There he opened the boot and thinking his sister was still alive, he hit her about the head repeatedly and savagely with a large rock. Mr Justice Hunt discounted a claim by Veach that alcohol and marijuana had played a significant part in his actions. He ruled that Veach did form an intention to kill his sister in order to hide his inappropriate sexual approach. Defence counsel had submitted that no such intention was formed and that he had simply shown a reckless indifference to life. In deciding on the sentence, the judge said special circumstances did exist. Veach was clearly contrite and had above average prospects for rehabilitation. Mr Justice Hunt sentenced him to a minimum of 12 years. Taking into account he's been in custody since his arrest last year, Veach is due for parole in May 2002.